So, Jonathan, you're on the East Coast. I'm in the heart of the Silicon Valley. Uh, there has been a very vocal crowd, certainly on Twitter, and actually some CNBC and Bloomberg and all these other articles, basically talking about Silicon Valley Bank bailout being nothing more than bailing out tech elites. The talk track grows. You billionaires and millionaires had tens of millions of dollars in checking and savings accounts. You're morons. You're idiots. We bailed you out. You should have taken a haircut. What say you? Do you think this was a bailout of the tech elites or maybe you haven't thought about it? I mean, well, yes, I think if you look at it one way, it it is for sure. Uh, but yeah. I think, you know, it, it's again, unfortunately, one of those situations where uh, there was an element of too big to fail here. And it kind of forced forced the hands of, uh, you know, the the Treasury and the Fed to 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 act and 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 I'll, and what I'm what I mean by this though is not necessarily that the the bank was like systemically important and would lead to like a like a crisis in all banks. I mean, there's some yeah. element to that, but I think what probably the the you know the powers that be were looking at was that the number of startups who were being funded, you know, who literally had like the money that they had been given by VCs is sitting in Silicon Valley Bank, all of you know their plans for the future, all their payrolls, all of this stuff was you know at risk, right? right. And so you you could have really damaged uh, the startup world if the bank went under, and yeah. and it would have would have caused a lot of unemployment, um, you know, in the startup world. Yeah, you know, it would have would, had would, second and third order effects. Yeah, it, it would have it would have like you know just crushed a lot of really promising startups. And I and I think the thought was that this is just something we really can't allow to happen. It's sort of too, it's too important, right? So if we yeah. have to bail out these tech you know elites in the process, well, that's just that's just a something side that effect. we have to do a side effect yeah. yeah i don't think that that's what i don't i personally don't think that that was what was on the minds of yeah uh, you know and i also don't think frankly that these tech elites had all their money in silicon valley bank right so they could have afforded to take the loss but i don't think that i don't think that the fed or the treasury really cared one whit about those people i think what they were really caring about was the kind of whole VC i can't make payroll right infrastructure right yeah. the whole the whole ecosystem of, yeah. of venture capital and all of these tech startups that would have been impacted. And I actually have a friend who's in the middle of like a big raise, right? And literally, you know, I still haven't checked in with him to see if he got his money, but he was supposed to get his money last week, right? So yeah. uh, it's, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's interesting. You know, it's interesting. It's, right? it's so the the beauty of this is I have receipts. One of the things that I wished for over the weekend, and there is precedent actually at IndyMac. Uh, Sheila Bear did this, who was the former Fed chair, or, no FDIC chair, sorry FDIC chair. Uh, so go back to in, go back to IndyMac. So IndyMac goes out all of a sudden, folks. If you don't know, FDIC actually has a watch board. So generally speaking, they're watching banks months, if not quarters, ahead of time, and they're prearranging gentle exits. Indy Mac goes out suddenly because I think it was Chuck Schumer. I may have my memory. This was a decade ago. It was a politician. Hmm. A politician said something and we he caused a bank run at Indy Mac. Indy Mac goes out in a 48 hour or three day window and they weren't ready. So again, it's the weekend, right? Sheila and her team are doing, doing whatever they do. And this is in the great recession. So it's already chaos. So what happened at IndyMac is IndyMac came out on Monday morning and said, we're going to give 50% of the uninsured deposits available. Because that's really what the crisis at Silicon Valley Bank was, was yeah. the uninsured. If you were under the limit, you were good, right? FDIC has a 100% track record of paying back. It was the uninsured. In Silicon Valley Bank, 97% of the deposits were uninsured, hence the problem. But again, IndyMac said, you can have your 50% of your money Monday. And then over, I think the next three months, they got most of that back. What I proposed on Saturday, knowing the IndyMac story, was I hope FDIC gives them 80 or 85%. Mm. I believe everybody and their brother knows about the 250K limit. 
So if you had accounts with more than that, you deserve to have some at-risk capital. I don't think you deserve to lose it all because these are deposits. Yeah. But I think there's some at-risk. So my hope was, again, they give 85%. Then as the bank is unwound and or bought, maybe they get seven, eight more cents, but there's some haircuts. I think the Valley would have been okay with that. As we know, what they chose to do was 100%. Now there's an implicit guarantee across the entire banking system that makes this the biggest bailout in history. And I don't feel good about that. And oh, by the way, we're not collecting the fees for FDIC. FDIC is woefully underinsured now. <clears throat> this is a, a problem that hopefully gets resolved soon, but I was not happy with the 100%. I believe the rule was clear. It's been known for more than a decade. You didn't play by it. You should have at risk. Now, you don't lose it all, but th that's where I stand. I was not happy with the 100% guarantee. But I think a lot of it, too, though, was, again, I think it came down to not so much the tech billionaires who had their money in the bank, but like a lot of companies who were doing their banking there. And like, sure. you know, somebody's, you know, weekly payroll could be well in excess of $250,000. Oh, yeah, I did the math. I mean, it only yeah. takes like 20 of 20 engineers to get over that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so you it's, it, and it's not really practicable for you to have like, as a business to have like a hundred different accounts at different no, sure. banks. You can have sweeps so, and other stuff, but yeah. yeah. I understand. So, so I think, I think, I think that that it's, that two hundred fifty thousand dollar limit obviously is designed to protect individual and depositors, dad. right? And, yep. uh, and and maybe this is actually kind of like an oversight if you think about it in the in the insurance scheme, where if you have a lot of companies who are at risk because, well, I mean they got to put their money someplace and they really it, they really can't spread it all over the whole banking system. No, that, I think that, I that, I, you know, I was yeah I was hoping one thing that would come out of this is there would be FDIC for individual accounts, which maybe yeah. stays at two fifty, maybe goes to five hundred, whatever you want to do. But then we create a second twenty five million dollar bucket for corporations or companies or right whatever, and, and then there's fees associated with that. Yeah, exactly. There should be fees associated with an insurance scheme, just like the FDIC, right? And if you've got that much in deposits, yeah, you can calculate the cost. Yeah, yeah, you're contributing to to the insurance fund to to make sure that Amen. your money is going to be there. I think that would Absolutely. be a, a good system. It puts the risk on where it belongs, right? So, yeah, and and for me, you're not adding cost to the individual. Right, because if everybody's equal, then mom and dad, insurance goes up or fees go up or costs go up. You got to separate them, right? And oh, by the way, when I fill out my business accounts, I check business account, not customer account, right? Or yeah. client or whatever it's called. So they know who's a business and what's not. So just change the rules, create another program. It should be relatively easy. Um, but yeah, I do think this was the largest bailout. I think it was overkill. Um, I think it's, I think it's, I, I, I enjoy capitalism, but I hate the idea of socializing losses. It just mm. annoys me. Like if you're going to go do at-risk capital and you lose, you should have pain. Pain is a great teacher. But right now, this this is what really this is what really pissed me off. Okay, they come out and they guarantee implicit guarantee. So what does that mean to Mike Zuber if he really wants to play this game? Michael Zuber should go out and find the most aggressive, risky FDIC insured lender or bank. It's paying stupid percentages like these crypto banks are paying 12, 18, 20, whatever they are. I'm sure there's a lender somewhere or a bank somewhere paying 5% interest today for money. I should just go move all my money there, but I'm not, I'm not going to, but I'm just saying that's how I play this game. It's like, why we're just going to, everybody's going to willing to take risks. And then when they lose, there's no penalty. It's just like, I hate that. I just hate that. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, somebody who was making a comment I saw that said, uh, oh, it was actually the Irish Times. So I read the Irish Times. And, and it's they're saying, you know, this crisis reveals that there are no libertarians in a foxhole. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. When there's a battle going on, no libertarians. Yeah. yeah so that, that like, you know, all the tech, all the libertarian tech elites, elites were suddenly yeah. very interested in yeah. socialism. Bail us out. Bail us out. Yeah. Socialism. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, man. Fun week. Fun week. Well, we're going to be at an event. You're hosting one in Vegas at the Link Hotel at the end of April that I am coming to because I want to get better. I have skills to learn. What is it? And you are offering a 30% off code to ORAT fans. So tell yeah, us about so it. So this is the Multifamily Wealth Project Conference. First of its kind, co-sponsored by me and my good friend Omar Khan, who is a very experienced syndicator, builder, uh, fund manager, and um, partner of mine in, in many deals. 
Uh, Omar and I put this conference on. We have gathered all of our, well, I wouldn't say all of them. We've gathered a lot of our professional friends who are experts in syndication, in finance, in banking, in all of the stuff that you need to understand right now. Uh, and we're getting together for a big party of capitalists, I guess, in, in Las Vegas, right, to talk about, uh, among other things, the banking crisis, rising interest rates, and what you need to do to protect yourself, but also how you can benefit from what the changes that are going on. Because it's always really, you know, the, the, the times when you make the most money are, are when there's an inflection point that you can take yep. advantage of, right, for good or for bad. Uh, there's always money to be, to be made in those situations. And you can learn from the experts uh, how this is going to be done. And frankly, you can learn from your fellow you know, audience members as well, because there'll be a lot of people there who are very sophisticated, uh, always adding to their skills, have a lot to, to say. And those kind of conversations in the hallway where you're meeting people are often where the most value is uh, in, in attending these events. And not to mention the fact that you'll actually get to talk with the panelists in the hallway and stuff too. These are not folks who are like standoffish and, mm -hmm. you know, going to be, uh, you know, keeping to themselves and not talking to you. You get, you get to just walk up to people like this and, and, you know, pick their brain on stuff, uh, including me, if you can catch me while I'm organizing this event, but it's going to be great fun. I really encourage you to be there. We've got a bunch of ORAT fans who are already signed up to go. Uh, I believe Michael is going to be, Having, hosting a coffee or a breakfast or something for uh, ORAT members who come and um, would really love to see you there. So uh, add to the numbers who are already going to be there. Uh, and like Michael said, you get a 30% discount off the tickets if you buy today. So use the ORAT30 uh, discount code at multifamilywealthproject.com. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Great week. Thank you.